Imagine for a moment you go to work one night. After work, you are talking to a casual companion. A man with a gun kidnaps the two of you, kills your companion, shoots you, and leaves you for dead. Somehow you survive, recover over the months from temporary blindness and paralysis. The police catch the murderer. He confesses and goes to jail. End of story? Not quite. Twelve and a half years later, the man who tried to murder you is out of prison, walking the streets, and you're scared to death. This is WGM Radio Chicago. That's what happened to a woman named Mary D., an announcer for WGN TV and radio, perhaps its most famous personality. This is the man who shot her, Samuel Drew. He wasn't much of anything, a loser who had spent most of his adult life in jail. Now he's 41 years old. He's been out of prison over a year. I was outraged. It was as though, you mean to tell me he's only going to serve four or five years of murdering somebody? and for attempting to take my life another two or three years or whatever that would amount up to and is very casually told to me, yes, that's the law and that's the way it is. I spent 13 years in prison. If, if I committed a crime, I paid for it. Let me be, become a productive citizen in my, own, in my chosen obscurity. To Mary, the release was not only a surprise, but a numbing shock. It made real again that horrible night in 1971. Mary D. had been a popular model, a radio disc jockey, and a television talk show host. Were you one of those hosts or DJs who insult people? No, I was a sweetheart. You were a sweetheart? Yeah, I was Mary D. the honeybee. <laughs> <laughs> As her popularity grew, her public appearances increased. And to her fans, she seemed to be everywhere. Samuel Drew hadn't been anywhere that year, except prison. Although he grew up in this pleasant area of South Chicago, he'd been in trouble repeatedly since his teens. In the six years since he turned 20, he'd been out of jail only five months. His latest offense, armed robbery. He'd been released from his sentence for that offense on July 9th, 1971. A week later, the lives of Mary D. and Samuel Drew collided. It was late, already after 10 o'clock when Mary finished work at Channel 44. A guest from another show, Alan Sandler, asked her for coffee. Afterward, as they sat talking in Mary's car, a man walked past. When I noticed him, I heard his voice. And he said, open the door. And I turned and I could see the silver gun pointed right inside this little crack in the window. And he just told him to move over. And he got in the car and said, drive. So, I... so Mary drove as directed onto one of the major highways that connects downtown Chicago with its suburbs. They had driven almost an hour when Mary was instructed to turn off. They drove into an isolated wooded area. And then Mary says she was told to pull over. They got out of the car, walked back into the woods. Then they stopped. And he said, don't try anything. Just lay down. And as soon as I laid down, I heard the first shot. That was at Sandler, not you. At Sandler. And the second shot hit me in the back of my head. And there was another shot. It hit Mr. Sandler and another shot. That one hit me at the base of the skull where the spine meets killed Mr. Sandler? Yes, he did. He murdered him. Probably. Did he think he'd murdered you? Oh, I'll bet he did. After Drew left his victims in this wooded area, he drove Mary's car toward downtown Chicago, eventually taking off for Detroit. In Michigan, Mary's car, going 100 miles an hour, passed a state trooper. The trooper chased it and stopped it and arrested Samuel Drew for driving a stolen car. In the car, Mary's purse and the murder gun. Drew was wearing Sandler's watch and ring. While Drew was talking to the police, Mary D was in the hospital, trying to survive the horror of the night that didn't end with two bullets to the head. After she was left in the woods, Mary managed to crawl out to the nearest road, stand up, and flag down a passing ambulance. By the time she got to the hospital, she was blind, her legs were paralyzed. She came close to death. Alan Sandler was dead on arrival. 
For Mary, the healing process was long and painful. It took almost a year for her to become well enough to work. About the same time it took for Samuel Drew to plead guilty. He was sentenced to 30 years for murder, 20 years for attempted murder, 30 years for armed robbery, and 30 years for kidnapping. So you were satisfied that justice had been done? Oh, yes. If Mary was satisfied with the sentence, it was because she didn't pay attention to the key word in the judge's order. He ordered Samuel Drew to serve all four sentences concurrently. That meant a maximum sentence of 30 years. After only nine of those 30 years, Drew came before the parole board. Toya Dorham, Mary's only child, was concerned that Samuel Drew might get out. She started asking questions, trying to find out something about Drew. She ran into bureaucratic walls until someone agreed to talk to her unofficially. Toya found out that Samuel Drew was coming up for parole. I wrote a petition and I got about 3,500 signatures to keep him in jail. And of course everyone was appalled, especially looking back at his record. Um, that was his seventh conviction. He was out on parole when he shot my mother and when he murdered, uh, you know, the man. And um, it was just, I thought the whole thing was ludicrous. Drew's release seemed improbable to Mary, her family and friends. And he wasn't released the first year or the second. But Mary realized his time behind bars was running out. Fearful, she moved to a new building noted for its security. We didn't film the outside of the building at her request, but it is a fortress. Shortly after Mary moved in, Samuel Drew moved out of prison. Were you notified officially that he was out? No. How'd you find out? Good heavens, no. He was walking around out here on the street just like I was when I found out. And someone saw him and called my family and told me. Samuel Drew was free, but only after he had served all the time required by law. Whether his sentence was too light or not, he is quits with the law. He has paid the debt society assessed. The average murderer served nine years. Nine years. Nine years of, uh, and it's not manslaughter, it's strictly murder. Richard Daly, Illinois state prosecutor, says this case was handled like many others. This would have to be after a judge had said firmly, I sentence you to 25 to 40 years. Sure, 25 to 40, 50 to 100, 100 to 200 years. We did a study of uh, hundreds of cases over the years uh, dealing with murder, home invasion, rape, and how people were paroled at earlier, earlier times. And this is uh, a frightening, I think, result to the American public because uh, criminals are not held responsible or accountable to their crimes. Mary's fear of Samuel Drew only intensified. Fear that after 13 years in prison, yeah, tomorrow, he might yeah. feel the need for revenge. Perhaps her fears were justified. After he was released, she started getting threatening phone calls. Here at WGN-TV, where she works, and at her apartment house. One call said, this is the day Mary D. dies. Who was threatening you? I felt that he was, Samuel Drew. But you had no evidence? No. Did you take them seriously? I sure did. And so did the Chicago police. Toya says the police were helpful for a time. They had escorts taking her to and from work. Um, they were watching over me, and it helped during that time. But you can't have that all the time. And it got to be so much that my mom and I left the country for a while. Did you leave messages for her at the television station? No, no. Did you call her at her apartment house? No, I haven't. In fact, I don't know where Mary D. live. I don't have any phone numbers where I could contact her anyway. After the threatening phone call started, the Illinois Prisoner Review Board forced Drew to sign these new parole papers. The change? A line forbidding any contact with Mary D. By the time Mary and Toya returned to Chicago, the calls had stopped. That was over a year ago. Do you think he's still a threat to your safety? I think he's still a threat, yes. I think that I worry about him being a threat not only to me, but to other people. See, I don't know anything about him. I don't know whether he really has had counseling and all of the things that I think that should be before a person gets out of jail. Samuel Drew says he's a changed man. He now says he was sentenced for a crime he didn't commit, even though he confessed to the murder and assault 14 years ago. He says he used his time in jail to get a college education. And since he's been out, he has worked steadily. I came home with, with, you know, with 
certain ideas about outside society. And my only problem has been from Mary D. When I got out, articles started coming out in the newspaper, a couple of magazines, her bidding her feelings, you know, over the air about me and about somebody that she really knew nothing about. Drew says the press, encouraged, he thinks, by Mary, got on his story and wouldn't let go. He was hurt, he says, in the pocketbook. He tried to start a small business selling specialty T-shirts. And I made a lot of good contacts, but once they found out that I, Samuel Drew, right after one of these vehement articles come out, I would never hear from my, my, you know, my potential customers again. You think he's got a point that he's being treated unfairly? Good heavens, no. That's the price you pay. He should have thought about that when he pulled the trigger. Mary had tried to keep track of Samuel Drew while he was in prison. She found, she says, that the law guarded his privacy more than hers. Her motives, she says, were not revengeful, but she thinks victims ought to know of approaching parole hearings and have the right to appear at those hearings. If I had had that opportunity, I would have wanted to know had he had counseling, was he coming out to a family? Was he coming out to a loving family, or were they angry with him for coming out too? She took her ideas to Jesse White, a state legislator. Together they drafted a bill that passed the House overwhelmingly. It was incorporated into a legislative package on victims' rights and parole accountability and became law last January. We think it's effective because it highlighted uh, uh, the parole system. It highlighted a great injustice to the victims and witnesses and highlighted how people were getting out of prison who got 100 years who were out in 12 years. But focusing public attention on parole problems doesn't help Mary. She still has to go to work every day and come home every night. She has to live with the reality of Samuel Drew's freedom. She does that by not only continuing her work for victims, but more surprisingly, working for convicts. She spoke in August at this fundraiser for Probation Challenge. Its purpose is to break the cycle of repeat offenses through intensive rehabilitation inside and outside prison walls. People ask me why am I involved with this organization? Why do I care? I care because them that we talk about and they that we talk about, those criminals come out. We cannot continue to just put people away and think that we're going to forget about them. Are you still personally afraid of Samuel Drew? Yes, yes, and I will be for a long time. I look forward to that going away. I look forward to a complete healing. Today, I do not have it. <laughs>